give you guys something to do over the weekend. YouTube. Hair. It's very, it's a weird song. All right, so we like to consider ourselves as human beings. We like to consider ourselves as relatively hairless. Compared to other animals, we do at least seem to be relatively hairless. The truth is that we do have hair on most areas of our body. It's easier to list the places we don't have hair than the places that we do. We do not, for example, have hair on the palms of our hands or on the soles of our feet. We do not have hair on the sides of our fingers and toes. We do not have hair on the side surfaces of our feet. Top of the feet, yeah, sides of the feet, no. We do not have hair on our lips, on our nipples, on the labia minora, on the clitoris, on the glands of the penis, or on the foreskin of the penis. And that's it. Every place else on our body, we have some kind of hair. Now, like the melanocytes, the number of hairs in various parts of the body can vary. So on our torsos and arms and legs, we typically have about 55 to 70 hairs per square centimeter. But on the face and scalp, as you might imagine, the number is a little higher it's between 600 to 800 per square centimeter. Now, the hair is produced in a structure called a hair follicle. And your textbook has very detailed illustrations of the anatomical structure of a hair follicle, but the only one I got as a transparency was this one, which is at pretty low magnification. It actually shows up better on the screen than it does uh, by itself, right? So here's the epidermis, here's the dermis, here's the blood vessels, and this structure here is the hair follicle. There's a couple of different parts to this. What we would think of as the hair that emerges above the surface of the epidermis, that's the thing that is called the hair shaft. So the actual hair is technically called the hair shaft. And it will grow up at, above the level of the epidermis. The lower portion of the hair follicle is called the hair root. That's the part that is below the surface of the epidermis down here. 
the hair grows, the hair is produced in a manner very similar to what we see with the epidermis of the skin. Uh, now, since I don't have a large, enlarged picture of this, uh, I'm going to have to uh, uh, draw it. So down at the bottom of the hair root is an area called the hair bulb, which is where the hair is actually being made. Now, I am simplifying the bejeebers out of this because I can't draw it with all of its complicated glory, but I think we can get the basic idea across here. Most of this hair bulb is epithelial tissue. which is to say that it doesn't have any blood vessels. But you'll notice it's got this kind of weird bell sight shaped structure. Wish I had my red pen, but I don't. This down here is dermis. And the dermis does have blood vessels. And so for each of the hair follicles, there is a little set of blood vessels that kind of comes through into this little projection of the dermis. This little projection here, right here, is called the dermal papilla. Remember what papilla means? Bump. Bump. So we have a little bump of dermis that's kind of formed in this invagination of the epithelial tissues of the hair bulb. These cells are getting, so these cells along here are getting plenty of oxygen and nutrients. They're very well supplied with everything they need to live happy lives, to grow, and to reproduce. Bless you. So these cells that are here by the dermal papilla are going to reproduce and divide fairly often. They're going to make new cells that are going to push out into the space of the hair bulb. And so what's going to happen here is that new cells are going to keep being added as these hair bulb cells are reproducing and the older cells are going to get pushed up away from the papilla and compacted together. These cells are very much like keratinocytes. They make that same protein, keratin. So as these cells from the hair bulb mature, they're making keratin. They're becoming dehydrated. They're flattening out and compressing together. And so as these guys get squeezed together and die, they're going to form the hair shaft. So they're going to flatten, they're going to dry out, they're going to die, they're going to get compressed. They are now going to form the hair shaft, which is going to keep being added onto from below. So as new cells are added, the older cells, the shaft cells, are getting pushed up the length of the follicle.
So down here at the hair bulb is where the new cells are being added on. And then as this matures and dries out and dies, it gets pushed further and further up. By the time the hair shaft actually emerges above the epidermis, there is no living tissue there. All of this is dead. All of this is keratin, which is why it doesn't hurt when you cut it off. And it regrows because the cells down here are still alive and are still adding on new cells. There are also cells down here at the bulb that are going to add color to the cells of the hair shaft. They're going to add in pigments so that as the shaft comes up, it will have color to it. Brown, black, that's our old friend melanin. Blonde is a variation on melanin called pheomelanin. It's like a, a mutated form of melanin that isn't quite so brown. So it comes across macroscopically when we look at our, our hair with our naked eyes as kind of a yellowy color. Red is a pigment called trichosiderin. What? She was laughing at me. Now, these are controlled by different genes. So a person can have the genes for brown, black hair, brunette hair. They can also have the genes for a blonde color. If they've got both, the brown color will kind of tend to disguise the blonde, although they might have highlights. And you can also have the gene for red color. And that gives us some of the weird variations. Like, if you have the blonde and the red, you get strawberry blonde. That kind of yellowy pink red color that some people have. If you have the brown and the red, you get a combination called Titian, in which the hair will look mostly brunette unless white hits it just the right way and then the red highlights show up. So it's very beautiful. So, that's the way. so I have two questions for you. Okay. Then what about gray hair? That was kind of next. Okay. All right. All right. Sorry. Yeah. Right. Gray hair. Gray hair, of course, we associate with aging. Uh, most people do not start life with gray hair. What's happening with gray is that these cells that are adding in the pigments are kind of doing it some days but not others. They're starting to stutter. You have sporadic deposition of color. So some of these cells will have color added, and then the next day the new cells don't, and then the day after that they don't, and then the day after that they do, or they get some color over here and not so much color over here. If you take a gray hair and put it under the microscope, it actually has spots. So gray hair is due to sporadic pigment deposition. And this is, like I said, this is, comes with age, that the cells are just becoming senile, they're becoming forgetful, uh, they, they, they took the day off. In what? Well, their hair follicle is older than it, it looks. It, it is actually, uh, there is such a thing as premature gray hair. And so even young people may have the occasional gray hair start to come in. 
Mine started to turn that gray color when I was 25. Yeah, it it's, runs in my family. Everybody in my family gets premature gray hair. Uh, so yes, it, it can happen follicle by follicle like that. It doesn't happen all at once. It tends to kind of go a little bit here, a little bit there. Some this year, some next year. Yeah. Sorry, another question. Go ahead. Well, <clears throat> on my beard, I have a lot of blonde and reddish hairs. Very common. By the sun, right? So what happens to the hair follicle? Like, if it's not a chemical, you know, like it's not chemically dyed, so why did it change pigment? It's very common among men to have their beard color a different color than their scalp hair. Uh, it it's, can, in fact, be very extreme where you have someone who's a brunette on top and has a bright red beard. Uh, it, it, hair growth, I, I was going to get to that eventually, hair growth is strongly influenced by hormones, in particular testosterone. And so men have beard hair because they have higher levels of testosterone. And it's probably influencing what color among your available color genes, which ones are being used. Well, it used to be all black. Yeah, so, that changes with age. Okay, or, but the environment can change it as well? To some extent, nutrition plays a role in this. Um, and again, as you said, UV light, sunlight can bleach hair the same way it will bleach color out of your clothing. I, I guess then my question is, how does it permanently stay bleached? You know, I mean, because when we bleach our hair, you know, it eventually turns back to its natural color. But these have never turned back to black. You know, it just continues being Again, blonde. it's probably hormonal. It's probably, it's probably your level of testosterone that's influencing which color genes. Um, let me just finish up one thing and we'll go back to this, all right? Because I wanted to talk about white. Gray and white are not the same thing. White is simply the absence of pigment. If those hair follicles stop putting in pigment altogether, what you get is keratinized cells. And keratin doesn't have any color, so the hair shaft appears colorless. It appears white. OK, let's, let's go back to, to, to the business of why does it change. One of the things that's going through my mind is that it's fairly common for people who've had cancer and who've undergone chemotherapy, uh, their hair all falls out, right? Because the drugs that are used for chemotherapy are supposed to suppress cell division. If you suppress cell division, your hair falls out and doesn't grow back while you're taking those drugs. So when they finish chemotherapy and their hair starts to grow back, Many people will report changes in the color of their hair or in the texture of their hair or both. The hair that grows back is not the same hair that they lost before they started the chemotherapy. It's as if the cells have been reset to choose different genes from their available chromosomal menu. So, so for example, straight hair and curly hair, people might have both genes for that. But during fetal development and childhood, the straight hair genes were the ones that the follicles were accessing. But now, because of the drug influence, they've shifted over and now they're using the curly hair genes. So the hair comes out curly or, or dry or brittle or something. And color changes are very common as well. So in a, in a less dramatic way, that's probably what's happened is that your hair follicles influenced by, by uh, your hormone levels, by other environmental factors, have kind of shifted over into which colors they're going to make. It's not a sign of any kind of disease or disability, but it's also, and it's also fairly common that beard hair and, hair and head hair just don't match. And of course, you've seen the commercials on TV for those just for men hair coloring things. Where they where they, they their beard has gone gray, but their head hair is still a normal color. So they want to comb in color on their beard so they don't look so old. Yeah. Again, that's that's not an uncommon situation where the 
the beard hair will age faster than the scalp hair. The beard hair follicles go gray sooner. Okay. So you got a lot of color choices out there. And then of course you run into the problem of people changing their hair color. The color you're seeing is not their genetic color, it's the one they chose at the drugstore. Okay, now we also have three types of hair. Actually, there's a lot of subtypes. So we have three main types of hair. These are called, I never know how to pronounce this, Lanigo, Lanugo, not too sure. Uh, this is the first hair you get. This develops in fetal life. So usually during the second and third trimester of the fetus's life in utero, they will develop this hair. And it can be just on their head and it can be all over their body. Typically, this stuff is shed just before or just after birth. The baby may be born with this hair, and the parents get all excited because they're like, oh, my baby is so smart, my baby is so evolved, my baby was born with a full head of hair, and then a month later, they're bald as a cue ball. They're, it all fell out. And they're, then they're not quite so chatty anymore about how <laughs> wonderful their baby is with all the wonderful hair. It, it just, it, it falls out in the uterus just before birth or just after birth when, you, when the baby's out. It's not permanent hair and it's not meant to be. Then we have something that's called vellus hair. These hairs tend to be short very fine, and usually kind of on the pale side. This is typically what we think of as our body hair. And then we have what's called terminal hair. This is the longer, thicker, usually darker hair of our scalp, eyebrows, eyelashes, the pubic region, the axillary region, and in men, the chest, beard, arms, and legs. So again, one of the effects of puberty is that as testosterone levels go up, the vellus hair in these areas is converted into terminal hair. Women, not so much testosterone. We hopefully keep most of our fellas hair on our face, arms and legs, and chest. Oh, let me show you this picture. This is a cool picture. I was gonna show this to you a little while ago and I forgot. It was sitting right here in front of me. All right, this is a super high magnification uh, electron micrograph of a hair shaft uh, just as it's emerging above the epidermis. And one of the things I like about this picture is it really shows you those flattened, scale-like overlapping cells of keratin, keratinized cells that form the bulk of the shaft. You can really see how those have been layered and plastered up against each other and they're very tough and they're very um, firmly attached to each other.
I just think that's a really good picture. So another question. Like, okay. You were saying that the skin is really sensitive to pain. It, mm -hmm. So like when you're tweezing your eyebrows or you accidentally pull a row of hair, is it because you're pulling the bulb and it's sending out that reaction? Or what causes it? I believe so. Um, the follicle itself doesn't seem to have a whole lot of sensory receptors associated with the follicle, but the surrounding dermis is going to have pain receptors and touch receptors. You feel the tug when you're tweezing, and if you, if you pull it enough so that you're going to break the blood vessels, you cause tissue damage and that'll set off the pain receptors. Pain receptors are usually triggered by cellular damage. So if you break open the blood vessels or you're, or you're pulling up the glands and the muscle and so on with the whole rest of the follicle, you know, if you pull up the, the root, pull it up by the root, you get more than just the shaft, uh, you cause enough damage, you'll set off the pain receptors. And of course, certain areas of your skin have more, have more sensory receptors than others. So some parts of your skin are more sensitive than others, including the area around your face. So, you know, you can tweeze hair out of your arms and you just like, ah. Uh, you tweeze, pull the same amount of pressure on an eyebrow or eyelash and you're going to feel it a lot more. All right, growth, hair growth. does not grow continuously. Those hair root cells are not constantly dividing at an even rate. It kind of goes in cycles. So we have periods of rapid growth followed by periods of rest in which there is little or no cell division occurring. Now, your textbook goes into much more detail than this, and I don't think that we really need to dig down to the, the names of these phases and all that kind of stuff. All right. Overall, on average, during the growth phase, the hair, will put, the hair shaft will have about two millimeters added to it per week. Although, again, this is variable. Different hairs on different parts of our body grow at somewhat different rates. The scalp, for example, grows faster than body hair. During the resting phase, during the resting phase, the existing hair shaft the shaft that's already there in the follicle will be held in the follicle. So it will stay where it is, and there just isn't, it isn't going to have any more added onto it. Then when the next growth cycle starts, this hair shaft will fall out. The old shaft is released, and a new shaft is begun. So at the beginning of the next growth phase, the old shaft is released and will fall out. Now, not only is hair growth discontinuous, it grows and then it stops and then it grows and then it stops, but it's also asynchronous. Different hair follicles are at different points in the cycle all over your body. So this hair follicle is just starting its growth phase. The next one over is in the middle of a growth phase. This one over here is at the end of the growth phase. That one's just starting a resting phase. That one's in the middle of a resting phase. That one's getting to the end of the resting phase. They're not coordinated in their activity in this way. And so, as different follicles go into their resting phase and then go back into their next growth phase, we're constantly losing hairs. 
they estimate that the average adult loses about 90 scalp hairs every day. And like dander, you're probably not aware of it. You, you, you shake your head, you run your fingers through your hair, you brush your hair, you comb your hair, you wash your hair, you lie down in your bed, you get back up, you lean back in the barca lounger, you get up to get a beer. You know, you're, you're, as you're moving around, the hair comes out, and you might notice one or two on your shoulder, or you might notice a few in the hairbrush, but you're not really aware that you're losing 90 every day. It just kind of doesn't really make an impression. It certainly seems like you lose a lot more than, than it grows. But like when you notice when you take a shower and you just, like, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> Well, I, you're a guy. I don't know. But it's, it's, it's different for men. Because <clears throat> there's this little thing called male pattern baldness. Yeah. So men, <laughs> men your age are actually losing more hair if they have the, if they're genetically going to have male pattern baldness. It's a genetic condition. Well, even you actually are losing more hair than you're growing back. <laughs> uh, I can I can sympathize with you because now that I'm past menopause, my hair's coming out too. Mm -hmm. But you're going to keep yours for another twenty or thirty years, so aren't you happy? So, yeah, but it's, yeah, when you say, doesn't it seem like I, we're losing, uh, what, what's the we, Kimosabi? It's you. <laughs> All right. This, the length of the growth cycle varies a lot. With scalp hairs, an entire cycle can go anywhere from four to eight years. While other terminal hairs, like brows and lashes, will have a growth cycle of only three to four months. That's why the hair on, the, on your head gets so much longer than your eyebrows and eyelashes, because it's going to grow for, say, six years before it stops. Whereas your brows and lashes are only going to grow for a few weeks before they stop. And then they're going to fall out a lot faster. So actually you lose eyebrows and eyelashes a lot faster than scalp hairs. So the people that are like in the Guinness Book of Records and stuff like that who have... Enormously long hair. Yes. Is that just like a genetic abnormality that they can grow it that long? You know, I get asked about that. Um, right now there's that commercial on TV with the guy who's got hair that's like 30 years long. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, what are they Geico selling in that commercial? Isn't it Geico? I'm pretty sure it's Geico. Okay, yeah, you're probably right. It's probably Geico. They're the weirdest commercial. Uh, but in real life, uh, one of the famous people for having really long hair is the country western singer um, Crystal Gale. Uh, her hair, the last time I saw a picture of it, actually reached all the way down to the floor. Uh, she claims that it's because of her routine of hair care, that she doesn't brush or comb it every day, because that obviously is going to put enough pressure to yank them out, uh, that she, she wears it in a braid unless, unless she is displaying the hair, and that she's taken, like, she uses special products and takes really, really good care of it, and gets plenty of sleep, drinks plenty of water, has a healthy lifestyle. She's a music person, and you kind of wonder about that. Don't they all do drugs and stay up all night? Yeah. Aren't they all kind of, and country western people? I mean, you know, Willie Nelson? Come on. So, but she claims it's because of her routine for hair care that she's, she's taking special care not to cause any breakage or damage, and that she's also not putting a lot of pressure on her scalp. It does seem to be an abnormality. Most people can't grow their hair that long, no matter how hard they try. It will fall out. So hair down to your waist or down to your to your buttocks is about mo what most people can manage. And now, how come braiding stimulates hair growth or makes it grow faster? I don't know that it does, but it does prevent damage or breakage. So, so it kind of puts the hair together so it's protected from abrasion 
you know, you don't brush, you don't brush your braid, you don't, you don't comb out your braid. Uh, it does seem, it does seem to protect. I don't know that it actually makes the hair grow faster, but it does keep it from breaking off, which will also appear as if the hair has gotten shorter. Okay. Yes, there is. They don't help with that. Uh, they're they're a, a symbiote that lives down in the hair follicles of your eyelashes and eyebrows. They're little microscopic mites, and they feed on the oils and the dead skin cells. But they're not helping you in any way. They're not. There's no benefit to them. Yeah, they just. They they just they just live on you. They're freeloading. That's exactly right. They're just you're secreting stuff that they will eat. So they climb down in there and they just live in there. But they they come out at night and crawl around on your skin and breathe, and then they go back in during the morning. So, but they but then they have to do waste products as well, yeah. don't they? So yeah. what do they produce on us as a waste product? Well. We haven't talked about the glands yet, but your hair follicles also have sebaceous glands, and this oil will kind of flush out their waste across your skin. So their their waste is probably part of the oil on your face. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is the recommendation that if you if you don't like the idea of having follicle mites that Soap is supposed to be the most effective agent against them. Wash your face with soap at least once a day. Get it, get onto the eyebrows and the eyelashes so the soap will, will and they, they don't like it, so you'll reduce the population. You may not get rid of all of them, but at least there won't be hundreds of them crawling around your face at night. Yeah, that's okay. that also You can have dry skin or you can have mites. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think there's like, I don't think you can go get like Ridex or something like to get rid of your follicle mites. <laughs> All right. Wait, wait, what? No, no, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I'm just thinking if. The dust mites and this, you know, if they, ever the fight, they and, ever fight for the same yeah, territory. But, but we're not talking about a serious parasitic problem. It's not like scabies that's going to cause disease. Right. This is, they're, just, they're just hanging out on you because you're a good source of food. You don't like them? Vacuum and wash with soap. <laughs> All right. Now, you may have noticed this little guy over here attached to the follicle. This is actually a little band of smooth muscle. Associated with their hair follicles are little muscle structures called the piloerector muscles. Also called the erector pili muscles. These are smooth muscle. One end of the smooth muscle structure is attached to the hair follicle, and the other, the other end is anchored into the collagen fibers of the dermis. And you'll notice that they're kind of at an angle here. Again, uh, I apologize for the fact that I can't draw, right? So when you are just looking at your hair, on your arms, in your, on your legs, typically the hair is emerging from the epidermis at an angle. So the hair lies down sort of flat. Right? Now these muscles are at an angle, 
And muscles contract. They, they get shorter. When the erector pili muscles or piloerector muscles contract, the overall effect is to pull the follicle into a more upright position. So when they contract, the hair stands up on end. And this is called piloerection. You might be interested to know that in Latin or Greek, pili means hair. Now, other animals have this feature as well. Birds have piloerector muscles attached to their feathers. Mammals have piloerector muscles attached to their fur or their hair. So when these muscles are stimulated in birds and mammals, what we get is the hair is going to end up trapping little pockets of air between the skin and the hair. The warmth of the skin will warm up this air pocket and it provides a form of thermal insulation. The hair will keep the air trapped against the skin so that wind isn't going to blow it away. And so you're going to end up with this nice little pot, this layer of warm air right against your skin that's going to help keep the bird or the mammal warm when it's cold. Uh, our hair isn't thick enough to do that. Piloerection in humans will occur when we get cold. You walk into a room that's chilly, your hair stands on end. And you can see the effect because as the muscle pulls on the hair follicle and the skin, it raises these little ridges on the skin that we call goosebumps. Some people call them goose pimples. Some people call them goose flesh. We have the same reflex to being cold as any bird or mammal. But because our hair is thin and wispy and short, it just doesn't do us any good at all. So we get piloerection, but we don't get any thermal insulation out of it. So cold is one of the things that will trigger this. Another thing that will trigger piloerection is fear, or other strong emotions such as anger, but mostly fear. When you walk into the room and your cat wasn't expecting you, they got all fluffed up, right? Or when, when the, your dog hears a, a noise outside and they start barking and growling, their hair stands up. They're angry, they're fearful, they're, they're upset emotionally. That makes their hair stand on it. Again, it works for us too. Human beings get fearful, they get anxious, they're watching a scary movie, they're trying to get through the parking lot when all the, the lights have gone out. You get worried, you get nervous, you get anxious, there's buggers, there's rapists, there's, there's burglars, there's murderers, there's pirates. You know, your hair stands on it. People say, oh, I felt the hair on the back of my neck go up. I was so scared. Oh, the, my, my flesh was just creepy because I was so scared. Now, in animals, birds and mammals, this kind of reaction makes the hair stand all the way out, it gets all big and fluffy, and the animal looks bigger, right? By getting themselves all fluffed up like that, they look less like lunch and more like a threat. Don't you mess with me, predator. Don't you mess with me. I can take you on. I'm too big for you to take this snack on. 
again, with human beings, we've got no threat display. Our hair's too thin, it's too wispy, it just doesn't work. We get the same reflex response, our hair stands up, we get the goosebumps, but nobody else can see it. <laughs> so you look just as much like a snack to that, to that uh, cougar, uh, that Florida panther, the, the you know, 16 foot alligator, they don't care how much hair, your hair is standing up on and they can't see it. So it, it doesn't work as a threat display, it doesn't work as thermal insulation, but the muscles are there and the reflexes are there and it works the same way as it does in your dog, your cat, or your pet canary. You get cold, your hair stands on end. You get scared, your hair stands on end. It just didn't do you any good. So that pretty much takes us through hair.